Okay, so what are we looking at here? Actually, this is the, the setup. Here we have the power supply, uh, two uh, transformers, each of them the usual uh, 50 hertz uh, commercial transformer. But uh, adding two transformers, we made a, a 100 hertz uh, commercial power supply. And uh, above, uh, we were able to measure actually the, the power input, how much uh, electric uh, energy is being consumed. And here we measure the temperature of the magnetrons uh, because we had to look after whether is it uh, overheated or not, usually not. This uh, little device uh, is a control unit of, of power supply, so we switch it uh, from a distance, but with this switch we are able uh, somehow to regulate the input power, power from 500 uh, uh, watts up to 1.5 kilowatts we, we were able uh, to influence. This is a radioactivity meter. We never found any uh, sign of uh, radioactivity or, or dangerous radioactive radiation uh, here. And over here <clears throat> is just uh, the uh, electromagnetic uh, kind of uh, noise uh, meter, electromagnetic uh, pollution, because sometimes when the <clears throat> cover of the electromagnetic cavity resonator is not pr properly screwed, uh, microwave uh, radiation uh, seeps out and it is dangerous because it, it, it can uh, harm your eyes. So it's just a precaution. And of course on the top uh, it's a very important uh, a device, the electromagnetic cavity resonator. Uh, the button, uh, you see a, a copper uh, plate, a circular copper plate, which is tunable, but we found out uh, the, the proper distance. Uh, and actually, this is the antenna of the magnetron, because this is the so-called TE, a transverse uh, electric uh, 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 resonator, which is uh, good for uh, cylinders, because then electric field within these uh, resonators are something uh, like this, and it, th those are uh, advantages for for spherical uh, acoustic resonators. If we want to use, uh, let's say. Uh, cylinders, long uh, uh, quartz uh, tubes, which is the cheapest. Then we have to use an, another type of, of uh, uh, microwave resonators, which is called the transverse magnetic TM. Uh, all the, this is uh, quite known in, in uh, electrical engineering. Uh, it has a different design, different uh, sizes, lengths, because the resonances are pronounced uh, uh, then uh, along the axis uh, of these uh, electromagnetic uh, radiators. But here, transverse electric fields are just across these cylinders, so quite different. This is a different reactor here, is it? Yes, uh, this is, let's say, Mark four. This is a Mark uh, three. Uh, of course, we started <clears throat> at first from entirely commercial microwave ovens, household uh, items, but we just changed the power supplies. In this Mark three, actually, which was sponsored by the Magnet Bank, it's a local community bank, it's a very small amount. Then, actually. Uh, we used uh, our own uh, electromagnetic cavity resonator, which was already more efficient uh, than a household uh, um, microwave oven. 
the household microwave oven was designed uh, let's say to warm up uh, soup or 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 a chicken but not uh, to maintain plasma so step by step we have improved our device uh, where the electromagnetic energy is more focused into the plasma this is very important and this is mark three but uh, it had a very still a very crude uh, uh, electromagnetic cavity resonator but some of the microwave uh, radiation just seeped through the the opening it was not a, a perfectly done device but this was our first uh, cylindrical electromagnetic cavity resonator which was quite efficient even uh, this length of this uh, periphery or perimeter had to be designed uh, to to nearly lambda quarter then there is very little uh, losses of, of microwave energy so these are uh, very important technical uh, details of the know-how it took us three years to figure out the best devices so down here you've got um the charcoal uh, charcoal powder, powder. and this, charcoal is, powder. this is this ground from the moderators from nuclear reactor or? no in in this very experiment we used ordinary commercial charcoal because uh, uh this uh our uh, supply of this high purity uh, graphite of the nuclear reactors has been quite limited so we don't have an unlimited uh, amount of this high purity high grade graphite but for ordinary experiments this charcoal does the same and in both cases uh, how did you prepare the powder actually uh, uh, for the uh, nuclear grade uh, 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 graphite it was made by a brick quite a big brick so it was even very hard uh, to break it into uh, pieces so a friend of mine a colleague of mine uh, used the what was the name of this uh, a file no uh, it's a rough uh, a router router oh no no uh, a re made? ream is it reaming it's got like little teeth in it yes yeah yeah, yeah. so and uh, then after it was ground uh, in a ceramic uh, vessel pestle and water okay. did you use maybe uh, a metallurgist's microscope to define the grain size uh, well actually later on uh, we had an access uh, to a, a very high quality microscope but before we used a simple inexpensive uh, so-called uh, digital uh, uh, digital microscope which is able to magnify only 20 uh, optically and another uh, 20 times uh, digitally so we were able to use at the early days these kind of digital microscopes uh, even we had uh, had the records and later much later we had uh, we built a huge device uh, in order to sort out uh, by size uh, the charcoal uh, which was based on laminar flow so at uh, one point uh, we had uh, a, a little engine uh, which uh, released uh, charcoal ground uh, charcoal and a gentle wind was blown by a fan and as it fell of course uh, the the crude part uh, fell straight down but the finer went further and further and further and we were able to collect uh, uh, by different uh, size uh, by the distance it traveled by the distance it, it traveled and actually for these experiments we found out that not the finest but some uh, micron or just below micron size of, of, uh, of carbon dust was the optimum 
there are two phenomena here one is the chemical combustion of course uh, and the other is actually uh, the uh, nano dust or or micro dust uh, plasma effect but uh, with this uh, device uh, the uh, dust cannot be maintained for more than three minutes because after let's say uh, two three minutes or four minutes uh, uh, in air uh, all the um, carbon is burnt mm -hmm. so after a while no carbon is left uh, you have uh, for the uh, fusion those three minutes and in the of course in the first one minute uh, it's it's useless because it takes one minute uh, for the system to heat up mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while the plasma is very cold not much effect takes place but after let's say uh, with this one kilowatt input power uh, the uh, quartz resonator gets enough uh, uh, heat so the uh, walls are are quite uh, warm up to 1000 degree at least the internal uh, side then the the transmutation starts but not before the first uh, minute okay. and uh, uh, at the very early stage when I had access uh, or a friend of mine had access to EDS we uh, we made a, a series of experiments it has been published in infinite energy anyway that we took samples uh, after two minutes three minutes uh, five minutes six minutes up to eight minutes after eight minutes uh, the sample evaporized completely and the composition is changing always more and more iron appears of course but uh, always we had to start this experiment uh, from the very beginning because once you have uh, this sample partially it is melted so you cannot use it uh, again and the melted part is uh, unfortunately sitting on the button and it's not always touched by the plasma the plasma usually uh, is uh, in the upper half or the upper three quarter volume of the uh, acoustic resonator so you are not always have uh, the plasma field uh, your acoustic uh, resonator that is the quartz resonator it is because it is uh, of course uh, lighter than than uh, uh, hotel the plasma is have always a lower density because mm -hmm. it's it's hotter so it is usually on the upper part but under some strange circumstances uh, we were able to find where the plasma is is preferably uh, in the in the under part uh, of the uh, resonator when the electric uh, field was quite uh, near to the uh, the maximum intensity of electric field uh, was near to the button in order to find uh, where is the maximum intensity of the electric field we use two methods one is cheap the other is more sophisticated that we used a vetted uh, paper of uh, fax paper which is uh, sensitive to heat so we put it uh, straight uh, into the uh, uh, cavity resonator mm -hmm. we switched it on and where it get uh, brown or black uh, it means that locally it was the the hottest part mm -hmm. because the electric field distribution here is by not far uniform mm -hmm. of course that that is the whole point to find the resonant uh, uh, points for the electric electric standing waves mm -hmm. so we have mapped it carefully step by step mm -hmm. the other is that if you have a, a, a small cylindrical tungsten lamp with two little short antennas to have a, a, a holder and uh, we have put it and we have mapped uh, actually the maximum intensity electric fields 
but at this experiment of course not the 1.5 uh, kilowatt was used but the the lowest uh, uh, power input of course otherwise uh, it would blow off immediately <laughs> okay. this, this this little lab so one has to carefully find out uh, the maximum electric field intensities and these are quite different for the TE and uh, TM type of electromagnetic resonators. Later on, uh, of course, lots of trouble uh, and, and trial and error, we found how to make efficient uh, spherical electromagnetic cavity resonators, which you have on, on your uh, pictures. Uh, it took us nearly two years manufacturing is difficult of course but to find out the the optimum uh waveguides how to to join the waveguide uh, to the sphere that was extremely troublesome we had so many failures but eventually we 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 have solved it and the cooling uh, of course that was also a problem and so on and so on and so on so um just to step back a couple of uh, points there. Um, um, when you say uh, nanometer, uh, sorry, uh, micrometer to nanometer, are you saying that maybe not above how many micrometers is you want to be below a certain number of micrometers uh, above 10 micrometers the the trouble is if you put uh, this huge grain it just won't stay in the plasma it, due to the gravity it will fall out of it and then on the small side uh, then it 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 will uh, like uh, dust uh, in the wind it mm -hmm. will whirl around it will stay in the plasma mm -hmm. But if it is uh, extremely fine, uh, uh, then uh, in in air it will burn out. But uh, uh, the the finest dust uh, can be used uh, in non-oxidative uh, plasma. That is hydrogen plasma or neon plasma or nitrogen or CO two uh, plasma. When the uh, we have done those experiment uh, and so also to eliminate this uh, sudden uh, combustion because uh, the maximum experimenting time was uh, here, of course, <clears throat> five minutes, mm -hmm. not more. The um, production of iron, uh, you described the uh, expected or the, the understood reaction pathway, and that involved uh, is it two carbons becoming? No, uh, what we what we think uh, that uh, uh, with the unification, you have it in the paper, from the carbon and nitrogen, you have aluminium, and two aluminium mm. can combine into iron. So but, but you, you could potentially just run this in a pure nitrogen environment and get iron? Uh, that is possible, but we used another... Uh, because in air it's more convenient. If, if you want to use pure nitrogen, uh, the whole system must be sealed and, and, and closed, pumped down at first, and then after uh, filled with nitrogen. But when you uh, switch on the system, <clears throat> ignite it, you have a sudden, of course, uh, you have a sudden uh, pressure peak and, and it spits out uh, the, the, the plug. So it is techni technically far more difficult to, to have an, uh, a, a closed uh, system which has a different atmosphere than air. With air, uh, the uh, making of the uh, quartz resonators, it is by far more simple because then uh, you have, we shall see it later, the quartz resonator has two different holes on it because it's a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that you would need a larger cavity, which then changes the electromagnetic resonance structure. 
um, to enable the uh, uh, sound resonator uh, to sit within it and be able to freely breathe, as it were, um, in that environment uh, so that it can have open ports to enable the free exchange of gas. In this case, it would be nitrogen. But you would still expect the same um, iron out if the other parameters in terms of energy concentration were met. Yeah, yeah. Um, later, I can explain it to you if we, if we go ahead. <clears throat> So, so the, these are what neodymium magnets? Ordinary commercial magnets. This is to demonstrate that uh, this is not a ferromagnetic charcoal. And the um, the plate there is that an aluminium plate? Aluminium. But it can be glass or paper. So the spatula there you're using is a steel spatula. Yeah. And you're placing that into this spherical acoustical resonator, yeah? Which is quartz. Uh, one big hole is visible there, but at the at the back of it, this is roughly 15 millimeters in diameter, but at the back you have, let's say, uh, 10 or, or 8 millimeter diameter other hole because these uh, holes together if you have just one hole you have one frequency but if you have two holes you like, get a beat you have you get a beat and so, you have, so you're creating uh two overlapping frequencies that uh, are they harmonically associated or are you trying to get them anharmonic so that you can have a moving beat but in, in nonlinear mediums like plasma, you don't you, you have not only uh, the sum of these, but the difference of these frequencies. You so uh, we have analyzed later. We had an acoustic spectrum analyzer, and there are very sharp, uh, distinct uh, uh, resonances, even in infra frequencies that is uh, below one hertz and uh, at one time we could borrow uh, ultra sound uh, sensors and it was up to 80 kilohertz so it's a quite wide range of frequencies of course with the ear uh, you can hear up to 15 kilohertz and that's it however ultrasounds you have quite regular but uh, of course uh, the amplitude is diminishing so after about 80 kilohertz the, the ultrasound is not intensive but uh, there must be quite uh, interesting uh, acoustic resonance uh, patterns within this sphere are you using the acoustics uh, for energy concentration or are you using it for a dynamic and movement of the particles both actually because one includes the the other uh, you have in this dusty plasma lots of uh, local um, acoustic uh, intensity peaks that is like the Claudney figures in in 3d and we had a slow movement we were able to observe that at certain points uh, the uh, carbon particles were quite shiny so they shiny shiny so they're being cleaned no they are they had much more uh, that that uh, was actually on on, on a slow movement camera where mm -hmm. you were able to see that some sparks mm -hmm. are, are visible So this uh, rod that you're putting in there, this is the 2B uh, pure carbon pencil, yeah. pencil refill. Yeah. And this resonator, it looks like it's been used before. Is that right? Oh, yes. We used it for a while. 
actually for one month. You're yeah. tapping it there so that the, 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 the carbon igniter, as it were, um, that's sitting across the uh, sphere as an, an arc or a division of the arc. And it is very important how it is uh, placed there because it, it must, on one end uh, of this uh, little pensive rod, must uh, touch the carbon sitting mm -hmm. on the back. And uh, on the other hand, it cannot be uh, horizontal uh, because then the electric field in intensity is little, but slightly upward, then uh, the electrical electrical field inside this resonator is intense enough so it will heat up uh, to white hot uh, in a fraction of a second and it will start uh, actually blow off uh, the the carbon the charcoal on the button or the carbon dust and then it will start uh, uh, to um, to turbulently distribute the uh, charcoal particles within the electric field and that will ignite the dusty plasma, the resonant dusty plasma. So as much as anything, it's used to uh, um, knock the particles up into the uh, environment. In the, yes. Uh, have you looked at um, maybe trying to just physically raise that or it, is it so important that you get that temperature as well in there? Yeah, it, it, is, it is important, but uh, there is no point uh, uh, to move and, and, and shake this acoustic uh, resonator from the outside. Uh, the whole stuff must be done uh, by the process itself. It's a self-organizing mm -hmm. uh, plasma oscillation. Uh, it's a, an important lesson that uh, if you are unable to find a self-organizing uh, uh, plasma oscillation, then you are doomed, because <laughs> na nature is much better. Anyway, from this point, as I see, you can see the, 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 the smaller hole mm -hmm. on it, and uh, uh, it, it's over there, it's a little bit dark for a fraction of a second you can see yeah so we have the larger hole here and the smaller hole and the smaller yeah. hole. It, it appears smaller because of perspective i guess yeah smaller than it actually is but it is small okay and so this is mica this support it, framework you've it's got a here mica it takes some patience uh, until you find out how to make these little stands from mica but uh, you can do it from from quartz but not from any other material because heat resistant uh, glass will melt definitely we have tried it's useless and the height here is important in important. terms of important. if you don't put this acoustic resonator uh, to the highest intensity of the electric field then the system won't ignite simply. and are you focusing the intensity on the carbon rod or on the, the carbon dust both uh, actually the the maximum intensity uh, field or region is about two three four centimeter wide and the rod and the carbon dust must be in, in the maximum intensity place. It takes patience and, and, and weeks to, to figure out it for, for each uh, design. So it's not, not a simple start. And, and once you have that, though, it's very repeatable. It's, it's absolutely repeatable. Mm -hmm. So this port that you've developed here to observe, these are um, the reason for cutting these holes at this size is because uh, to look through uh, and it is open uh, actually but uh, the thickness of the lid is important this is six millimeter and uh, the diameter of these uh, ports are also six millimeters but uh, at uh, l per d one to one 
uh, allows you uh, to have uh, a to, to close the microwave radi radiation otherwise uh, it would escape so the design of the the number and the depth of these holes are also important and we were helped by an elderly gentleman who spent all his life in in microwave devices his health was absolutely essential apart from textbooks of course mm -hmm. I notice you, you faded through it, you put um, some bolts in here. Is, is there any kind of pressure seal there or? Of course, it has to be tightly uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, the surfaces uh, must be machined perfectly, it must be smooth. Otherwise, if you have, let's say, one tenth of a millimeter of gap, the microwave will escape. It's, it's very dangerous has been machined um, to, to mirror surface. So you have uh, two switches and a, a rotary dial, is that right? Or is that yes, another switch? Uh, for, the, for the power. Okay, and is this a frequency selector or, or what, what are we looking at here? This the power. Uh, we are regulating the, the uh, amount of power, uh, power mm -hmm. actually between 500 and 1.5 kilowatts, something mm -hmm. like this. So that, that hump that is, 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 is 100 hertz. 100 hertz, mm -hmm. but of course there are higher and lower frequencies, but the 100 hertz component is the loudest. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, depending... There was a slight tonal shift there, and that's because of the temperature and the environment. It's changing. Yeah. No, no, I mean, the system is, is gradually being heated heated therefore the the fundamental uh, frequency though is is uh, 100 hertz but the other tones um, the higher uh, frequencies are, are changing mm -hmm. No, the, the whole process is uh, roughly four to five minutes, but it it was cut mm -hmm. to a shorter period. It's cooled down. And now some, the presence of, of iron is, is shown with this very small, uh, very simple device, however, uh, it is not the iron was the most interesting, but as I wrote in the paper, we have found aluminium and uh, calcium and, and lots of other materials when we use uh, pure carbon, high grade carbon. For charcoal, we used only this for demonstration and for technological development. And what was the maximum sort of uh, iron content? How, how do you measure it? A uh, couple of percent, maybe. Mm -hmm. One, two percent. Um, obviously, it's got to be enough such that the magnetic field can lift the particle that contains the iron. Um, when you're saying it was a percent, is it a percent of the overall carbon mass? Or were, were the particular, you were describing earlier about how um, you can get melting of of the produced material is is it melting iron and that's falling to the bottom and and then you've got more pure grains of iron yes but uh, of of course uh, if you wait with those uh, iron particles for let's say eight minutes even that will disappear in the plasma because uh, with the air you form iron oxide which is rust 
and uh, after a while in the plasma it also melts and evaporates mm -hmm. so it's not worth waiting too long so this is another um, quartz so, resonator yes uh, this is a collection of some experiments but uh, I remember that these were filmed via also a mesh you don't see it but it is there mm -hmm. uh, a mesh otherwise uh, it's impossible to record but it was a transverse magnetic kind of longer and thinner electromagnetic cavity resonator um what i'm seeing here is the blower has blown a sphere and then he's fused on these tubes is that right yes and uh, they look a similar diameter this time or is there is some variation there no it it doesn't have to be uh, different uh, uh, diameters and uh, even we used resonators for the radioactive test when we had only one kind of handle not not a, 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 a two-sided so you call this a handle and, and that's something that sits outside of the resonate the um, microwave resonator it's a very complex uh, acoustic resonance actually because uh, uh, the plasma is somewhere here but the, uh, the hot air sitting at the end of the tubes acts as a ma mass. Uh, the plasma is the spring and uh, the hot air at the end is the mass and, and this uh, together starts to oscillate. Mm -hmm. If you are able to tune it uh, to resonance, it can have a very powerful uh, acoustic uh, resonance so actually it is not only the plasma oscillates but uh, the plasma is in is coupled uh, uh, inertially to the ambient uh, hot air and you have to be really smart and and uh, patient uh, with different acoustic uh, resonator uh, designs like uh, for example, the organs were designed by the Germans for 300 years, refined step by step, or the violins of Italian masters are actually uh, 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 devices uh, which are uh, transforming uh, transverse uh, waves uh, of the what was the name of the, strings of this strings string strings yeah. I'm, I'm quite stupid now so the strings are oscillating uh, here in a transversal manner transversal manner but the violin is a device to transform uh, these transform transverse waves into longitudinal waves and uh, uh, coupling uh, to a resonator uh, actually our device is an electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic um, violin mm -hmm. I, I used to study very carefully the, the design of all string instruments piano guitar and and the uh, <clears throat> violin because uh, the the task to be solved it's quite the same but uh, the, the physical layout of course is different <laughs> yeah, yeah. this is with a single tube yeah mm. okay and you're saying that this photo is taken through uh, to a mesh, mesh. Uh, yeah. uh, because it is out of focus it is yeah. not very visible we so have... you, you can see on this image some dark spots which yeah. are not in the plasma that there, there is a result of taking a photo through the mesh sure. Now this is a, a typical uh, tube-like uh, uh, resonator, which is the maybe the the easiest for the layman to do. But even then, it is preferable to have a little belly, mm -hmm. because otherwise, the if you don't have this belly, which which is capturing the plasma, the plasma will just slip come out. straight out. Okay. And, and it will burn your device. <clears throat> so you could, for instance, um, use some sort of um, uh, acetylene 
maybe to heat the uh, quartz up uh, and then i don't know maybe push from the outside to create the the, the bulb as it were uh, actually we have done this type of test also but this is not uh, the the ideal resonator mm -hmm. i don't have a picture of that but it's also something similar but at the end we have trumpet like uh, mm -hmm. uh, ending uh, which helps uh, uh, to contain the acoustic energy below 600 hertz within the system mm -hmm. of course above uh, 600 hertz all the acoustic energy is escaping but uh, having half of the acoustic energy uh, contained in the system and used for resonance is increasing the efficiency of the device it took us years to figure out mm. the the for, for, for a sort of citizen experimenter uh, if they were to get some quartz tubing um how would you recommend they get the quartz to the temperature uh suitable for uh, creating deformations uh, uh, the quartz will uh, melt at 1700 degrees C and uh, this is a very severe uh, limitation uh, to our experiment. You cannot do anything about uh, it. But in fact uh, at 1500 degree the quartz gets uh, uh, already recrystallized. So if you have let's say power above 1.2 kilowatts then you are on this road uh, road that uh, your quartz will be recrystallized and after about uh, three or four shot it will eventually get um, opaque mm -hmm. it's it's no longer transparent and it will break eventually quite soon that that's a very interesting point you made but what i'm saying is how would someone uh with uh, available ma ma uh, equipment raise the temperature of the quartz in order to affect uh, a change to make a resonator so if they w wanted to take a piece of available um uh, quartz tubing you know for instance they could they they could actually buy a quartz tube tube, but you you can actually get um, uh, quartz tubes for uh, halogen lamps, and they actually have some deformation deformation in them already. Have you did you try one of those? Uh, those quartz tubes were of very small diameter, 10, 10 millimeter. They are mm -hmm. useless. So uh, so how you, how big uh, should it be? Um, 15 millimeter is is the the lower limit uh, at these power uh, uh, supplies and uh, 25 is the maximum so uh, the diameter must be in between so perhaps if they could find some sort of quartz lamp bulb that was in that range but you're right they tend to be crimped don't they and uh, the crimps sure, are very small so. So how would they get the, the quartz to the temperature? I mean, electrically heating to 1500 degrees to make it soft, maybe is not... Uh... No, I mean, you switch on the power supply. No, no, I mean to make the resonator, not... not oh, for the manufacturing. To the make... You have to go to the uh, glass blower who is able uh, to deal with quartz, and that's uh, the bottleneck, actually. And if you don't have uh, anybody, then you are doomed. I mean, they could, for instance, have platinum wire and put power through that maybe to get it hot enough. Or maybe they, well, what flame are they using? Are they using... A hydrogen flame. It's a hydrogen flame. Hydrogen yes. flame. Yeah, yeah. But it's that's, that's, a, my, that's what I was trying to get to. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, yeah. a, it's a really art. And, and uh, you have to have... Uh, uh, a skilled uh, glass blower who is able to to do it uniformly and that takes uh, 20 years of experience mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. don't try to make your own uh, 
uh, quartz uh, doomed to fail. <laughs> so maybe there's a market for someone who <laughs> that they didn't weren't aware of. And this is when you when you're saying modulated. So the frequency is modulated. Then sometimes uh, at certain frequencies the plasma is moving away. Uh, because uh, the electric fields are not uh, permanently at the same place uh, within the electromagnetic cavity. At certain frequencies you have maximums at uh, this place, at other frequency that place, so th therefore the plasma is moving. The electric fields are moving. In uh, Piantelli's most recent uh, patent addendums, uh, his modifications to his patent, he's talking about his preferred method for triggering the effect is to use um, uh, microwaves. Uh, and uh, th this would indicate that it's creating some sort of plasma or some sort of ion species in, in the reactor. Um, but what you're demonstrating here amply is that uh, you're not going to get your plasma stable or formed unless you have uh, a good idea of the resonator that you're creating. So it's not just a case of applying a microwave to any old cavity. It needs to be a very specifically designed structure. Designed, yeah, and that uh, requires lots of uh, know-how and, and uh, experience. Uh, we had uh, six uh, highly skilled people in, in our lab. Each had uh, his own specific uh, skills. Mm -hmm. So we can see the uh, yeah the carbon rod here, and uh, this is what's creating the heat to knock that up initially. Yeah. And the carbon dust is sitting at, at, on the button, but uh, so what are we seeing coming down there? Uh, carbon particles. Mm -hmm. This is the rod uh, which was blown <laughs> up. Yeah. Quite a, a storm inside <laughs> the, the resonator. Yeah, but you can hear it. It's a loud noise, right? And it is a, a turbulent uh, uh, flow, and you can see the big grains. Of course, the finer grains you are unable to see. So what people are seeing here is is not some sort of geometric structure that's regular. This is uh, a one did. one particle that's very bright, and it's some sort of diffraction or or through the grating the micro the, the grating the, the mesh yeah actually. And it's creating these kind of it's an optical yeah effect. you can see the now the it looks there. like there's beams coming out of here but is that actually coming into the tube is this, i can see these kind of things that look like they're sparks coming <laughs> directly out what, what's going on there Actually, it is from previous experiment, we have some fine uh, carbon dust settled on the neck mm -hmm. and it is also participating. So, oh, okay. so we have some carbon there. The necks were always the crucial part because uh, they melted first. Uh, the intensity of the plasma was uh quite high there so you see at first you you don't uh, feel the whole uh spherical cavity mm -hmm. with plasma only partially later when the system reaches an equilibrium temperature then so what you're saying is if the glass is too cool, you get a thermal gradient and this breaks the plasma down. Of course, it cools down. 
And so you need to get the glass to a temperature. And you mentioned that temperature earlier was about... 1,000 degrees. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it will cool down and the plasma will vanish, mm -hmm. of course. I, so I actually see there's a, quite a few people on YouTube and they are using, I don't know, a, a, a beer glass or something. And they're, they're doing creating plasma. But of course, invariably, they melt the top of the beer glass <laughs> because it's coming up and it... And it, the borosilicate glass is just insufficient to handle it. This is what you see with your own eyes, uh, mm -hmm. because previously it was uh, slow motion. No, uh, this is a, a spherical resonator mm -hmm. and you see, see the two different diameters. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what have you got here? You've got a pipe sort of coming out. Yes, uh, sometimes uh, we wanted actually, with the help of the pipe, uh, to measure the acoustic uh, uh, spectra. And mm -hmm. we hope that with the help of the pipe, we can measure it. Uh, here, this is the carbon rod, mm -hmm, red, mm -hmm. red hot, the pencil. After a while, of course, it burns. The red hot, um, the fact that that's uh, emitting infrared rays, do you, th do you think that might be an important part of what's going on? It's not the infrared, but being so hot, it is continuously emitting very small carbon particles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It just melts, and, and this acoustic oscillation also helps uh, uh, to, uh, to take out uh, small carbon particles. So all the time it is sweating carbon. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, the carbon dust at the bottom also. Mm -hmm. This is a plasma uh, where the frequency is, is lower. This is not a dusty plasma. This is just a smooth, ordinary textbook plasma. Mm -hmm. with very little dust in it. Mm -hmm. But from time to time, uh, of, from the carbon sitting on the button, uh, it is disturbed and then some carbon dust is, gets into the plasma. I can hear, see that you were talking about the fluting. Yeah. And you, you have this uh, bell kind of end here. If you look at the acoustics, uh, the, the spectrum distribution is quite different for this kind of resonator than the previous or the others. Mm -hmm. Each of them have their, have their own characteristic uh, frequency spectra. That's just a straight tube, isn't it? Yes, mm -hmm. this is a straight tube. And an ordinary household uh, microwave oven. Mm -hmm. It's a very old. Okay, so this is the device that we saw more recently, was it? No, but it's a very similar. It's a very similar, but it's also a, a transverse uh, uh, electric. But this was more developed uh, because you have the two tubes which we used <coughs> for pumping down. So not only atmospheric air, uh, but uh, below or above uh, the uh, atmospheric pressure, we did experiment and with some experiments with nitrogen also and CO2. Did you have a Kovar window or something on that to observe it, or were you running with these blind? Uh, glass. 
glass. Yeah, glass. A thick glass. Oh, I see here. Yeah. So this is this a device no, or not? No, no it's this different is one. a different. Here, this is a TM mm -hmm. transverse magnetic where the uh, antenna is at the uh, center and at the bottom, mm -hmm. and it has a conic conical connection to the electromagnetic. Uh, resonator and the power supply is also different uh, with this uh, we were able uh, to tune the frequency slightly so you have two variacs here yeah uh, so this is transverse magnetic and this is transverse electric okay this is a transverse magnetic from the side and a little window we have there. And again, a transverse uh, magnetic. This is not the same uh, cylindrical resonator as before, but uh, roughly the same size. This was this is a pressure vessel, and we were able to pump down the system. Uh, to study it under different uh, pressures and different gases. The window here, that didn't affect the resonance in there? No, no it was carefully designed not, uh, not to disturb it. So we, we have this mesh inside and the glass outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't like a normal microwave, but you actually got it so it can seal in this case. So what would you say is the most significant results that you're saying here? Uh, I think that uh, we were able to, to fuse uh, carbon and air into copper, zinc, titanium. Uh, the sulfur is, is a quite a small amount and uh, you got only on some particles, but two, with the fusion of two oxygens, you get uh, sulfur. Do you think that these kind of uh, um, environments can occur in volcanic ash plumes? Because I see these, Possible. I see these incredible electric fields being generated that create lightning. Um, for instance, if you look at the, I'm going to try and say this, Ayers Foyer Fukuoka glacier uh, that happened in Iceland. It's fantastic. Uh, plumes and and then these lightning you know this kind of dusty plasma might occur on two environments in the magma of the earth mm -hmm. and uh, and in our own cells in the cells of uh, living beings so how would you say that it would occur firstly in the uh, magma i mean it seems like it's a it's just a, it's a fluid it's a plasma. It's a plasma because it's high enough Hot. temperature. Yeah. So the, the electrons are not associated with particular atoms. Not as efficient as our plasma. Mm -hmm. You don't get it within uh, two minutes or so. But if you have time. A few billion years, for instance. If you have time. Yeah. <laughs> you only need the occasional occurrence. So so you're saying that, that, that maybe that, that copper, for instance, in, uh, production could occur because of very long periods of time. These are the possible reactions. And uh, I'm very proud that we were able to have this reaction when from titanium with uh, nitrogen and oxygen, you can get uh, copper and zinc. So this is tertiary, tertiary reactions. Mm while the Oshawa is mainly about the, the primary chain uh, with, uh, with uh, quite a quite rudimentary uh, device, an arc between uh, two carbon or graphite rods are able to create these reactions. But if you have patience, then uh, let's say from these materials, uh, you can get to the next step and then after to the third one. It's a shame you can't create 63 nickel this way. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing that these are all stable. Um, 
it's interesting that what what explanation would you say that you're getting just a stable production like uh, the pieces of the lego, lego. Uh, uh, if you have uh, let's say two or three uh, starting elements uh, you are able to form maybe a car but not an airplane mm -hmm. uh, for kids so therefore uh, from these three starting elements carbon oxygen and nitrogen this what modern nature allows you but if you have let's say boron or lithium or whatever else uh, in the initial picture which we didn't have then you have different paths okay so you're saying this reaction path is um the most interesting yes because uh, in a condensed form uh, you see all the possible uh, fusion uh, reaction and and the steps uh, from the three initial uh, nuclei uh, carbon, oxygen, and, and nitrogen, and uh, this is quite a common element uh, on Earth. And uh, these are the possibilities uh, with uh, carbon and nitrogen, you get aluminium, and uh, with two aluminium, you, you get the, the iron. Though, in principle, there is another uh, road uh, to iron and i have mentioned in the paper also calcium also and uh, it is quite strange that all kind of these uh, elements uh, which are the end products silicium calcium iron magnesium uh, uh, sodium uh, no this is potassium mm -hmm. uh, copper zinc and and sulfur are <clears throat> the elements what, necessary uh, for life for life yeah and then um so and who who first discovered this chain i mean uh this is my my work but uh, the oshava chain uh, is the inner part actually uh the aluminium and uh, iron magnesium uh silicium uh sulfur uh was discovered uh, by george oshawa with this uh, simple arc uh, mm -hmm. electric uh, arc experiment but their technology without any resonators were unable to reach the outer circle mm -hmm. however here we uh, with the combination of nitrogen and oxygen, uh, there should be phosphor. We haven't found phosphor in our experiments, but because of our resonators were open and... Uh, the temperature's high, and you temperature, can get a vapor and... It just went. Later on, uh, with uh, similar... Uh, actually a uh, similar experiment we had where we had uh, uh, nitrogen and oxygen and uh, and instead of uh, pure carbon uh, we had uh, uh, zeolites then we have found an ample amount of phosphor but in a closed system when mm -hmm. it was unable to escape mm -hmm. so definitely in my opinion phosphor is there but in this experiment where uh, you have seen this uh, spherical resonators were open and not closed, phosphor was able to escape. Phosphorus, yeah. Um, okay, so this, and this is, I, I imagine, very fascinating for a lot of people. So you has, have, without doubt, in your mind, uh, observed all of the elements that you see on this tree. This is what the EDS machine have found. Mm -hmm. uh, I never talked with the EDS machine that what is my, <laughs> my <laughs> wish list. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. just spit out and, and my colleagues had no idea how I got uh, this experiment. Those were found in little uh, ferromagnetic uh, droplets. Right. They cut it and they... And the uh, iron beam cut it. Uh, they, no, no, they cut these little... Uh, 
<clears throat> uh, ferromagnetic uh, beads of let's say half or one millimeter diameter which we found at the bottom mm -hmm. of the uh, acoustic resonators we send them for analysis they cut it in half uh, polished it and the electron beam of the eds edx uh, machine measured at 10 different uh, points uh, the distribution of the elements and on the surface uh, iron was more pronounced and uh, in the in the uh, center of the uh, of these uh, little droplets uh, they told magnesium and, and calcium and silicium was the dominant so it's almost like as it's condensing down um, in, in, I guess the things on the outside, if there were things like magnesium in an oxygen environment, you're going to get magnesium oxide or sure. whatever it would burn away. And... Uh, in my opinion, uh, the frequencies are also important, the, the plasma frequencies. Uh, so uh, given, now I'm just dreaming, uh, given enough uh, money, interest and patience, we would be able uh, to influence uh, the fusion paths, the familiar fusion paths, by influencing uh, the plasma parameters. Like uh, in the modern nature, actually, in the solar corona, uh, these kind of reaction paths are possible. So maybe these elements are created not inside the uh, the the, the, the core sun, of the sun, but not, not in, in the, the corona. Core, but in the corona. As I said earlier, you're only seeing stable elements. What do you think is predisposing nature to just create stable elements? I mean, you're starting with stable elements, for one. Uh, of course... Oh, oh, one of them isn't, the uh, carbon. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, for example, we haven't found uh, uh, scandium though with the combination of uh, just proton-wise, aluminium and oxygen should yield scandium, but we never had from these elements enough neutrons. So scandiums were not observed in, in our experiments because a scandium is, has an odd number of protons and it requires unproportionally large amount of neutrons. Therefore, we, we had no supplies of enough uh, neutrons, therefore scandium hasn't been formed, though if it were just uh, quite uh, random, how come that uh, there is no sodium here and lots of other elements, only uh, specific roads are allowed via this fusion reaction chain. And have you... Uh, calculated what the energy yield should be from some of these reactions? No, but it's... Uh, Both it's positive a, and negative. Yes, uh, it's an interesting idea. Actually, then Somsky figured out <clears throat> that in this uh, family of reactions, uh, roughly the formation and diffusion uh, energies are balancing each other. So with this family of reactions, you don't gain and you don't lose too much energy because for some fusion reactions uh, you require energy uh, some uh, uh, elements uh, are formed uh, uh, let's say uh, <clears throat> creating uh, some fusion energy but uh, as as the family if you take them together it's a zero gum, zero sum game. In that case, would you not say that it would be therefore more difficult to create a specific route? You're always going to have a balance of, of reaction products. Yeah, but if you start looking for energy, I would opt for uh, carbon only and in hydrogen or heavy hydrogen environment. Then, then. Uh, diffusion would be uh, uh, certainly yielding lots of energy. It's technically demanding. So 
these are just photographs. I think we've seen some of these uh, before. Uh, anything to note on these? Yes. No, these are still photographs mm -hmm. uh, which I prepared for the patent application, but uh, the patent, uh, due to the lack of money, actually relapsed. So, um, from our point of view, as an organization that replicates other people's claims, um, that's something we would like to do first. But what what is the thing that you would most like to do moving forward? Uh, actually, this method uh, the, with the microwave uh, could be developed uh, uh, to to manufacture artificially rare materials, uh, which which is sooner or later will uh, industry will run out of it rare earth materials or let's say palladium or 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 other industrial uh, catalyst uh, materials this is one uh, profitable and and technically viable method but it requires even more funding uh, uh, really to to have a good power supply and uh, an automatic feeding uh, of the uh, materials because we did it only intermittently by hand it requires a degree uh, uh, an order of magnitude more work uh, to have it uh, automatically uh, done i mean the feeding and the frequency controls acoustic and and electromagnetic we were half uh, that way or one third that way from time to time we were able to synthesize uh, palladium but not in a regular method because when you do it everything uh, by hand uh, technologically you are just unable to repeat always the same stuff even the resonators were not always spherical they had their own uh, uh, like uh, like a, a lady they had their own special own features one resonator uh, had these frequencies harmonics uh, the other had the different harmonics like two violins they are not exactly the same therefore some prefers the Stradivarius uh, some other people the Guarnini uh, violins uh, our acoustic quartz resonators were hand blown they were there were no two exactly identical they were similar but not identical but in order to have uh, the same results in industry you have to be able technologically copy strictly the same parameters we were not financially there uh, I was mentioning your work to Bob Higgins, and I, I mentioned this the other day. Um, uh, and he said, oh, this sounds a bit like Santelli's work. And he was using uh, electric arcs. Um, and you mentioned that o Oshawa. Oshawa. George o Oshawa. Oshawa. Um, and his nationality was? Japanese. He's Japanese, yeah. So it, he had done the inner circle of your reaction tree. But Santelli had taken maybe Oshawa's work or his own inspiration forward that you were unaware of Santelli's work. I am also unaware of Santelli's work so I'm now really inspired to go and see because he said that under certain circumstances you could generate what what materials you you, you wanted that were fairly deterministic. In my opinion to, to have it uh, to do it uh, efficiently uh, you cannot uh, miss uh, these resonators without uh, these uh, resonators it is uh, technically it's never viable mm -hmm. you can make uh, a ppm order part per million but not uh, grams per million so the order of magnitude uh, of our uh, device i mean the, the proportion of fusion is much higher in our device.